Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Liz Fenton and I'm here with Lisa Steinke, who is my co-author and best friend of over 30 years. Um, our seventh novel is coming out this July. It's called How to Save a Life. And you can pre-order a personalized copy at Warwick's. Uh, but we're not here to talk about that today. Um, we're here to talk to the wonderful Britt Bennett about her new book. And I, um, we're also here to celebrate Warwick's who is our partner on the Couch Surfing Book Tour. So Julie, I'm gonna pass it to you. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for coming and joining us here. We've got a great room full of people that are so excited about this book, Britt, so thank you. Um, I was telling Britt before you all came in here that it was a couple years ago that we were all in Warwick's with a great crowd of people. So I'm so glad that all of you are here virtually with us to help support this. Um, it's not quite published. It'll be published tomorrow. So um, you can still pre-order it tonight though. I'm gonna put the link in the um, comments field. So you can just click on that and order it. We have signed book plates um, for the book from Brit. And um, so you can do that. I'm also gonna put Liz and Lisa's link on there. So if you guys are interested, um, it's a great book too. And we got, you can um, click on that as well. We need book sales, so <laughs> bookstores are, you know, if you want to see us around and have these things, please buy books from us. Um, we will ship them to you. I used to be like really cool about it and go, oh, this and that's like, no, I'm just going on and just yes. like buy books, people. <laughs> um, you can order online. Uh, we are actually open for browsing. If you're in San Diego, you can come to the store. We'll do, um, you can do curbside, you can come in. So um, warwicks.com for us. Uh, I want everybody to know, because it might not come up, Liz, Lisa, and Britt are all San Diego high school, San Diego County high school girls. So this is a, maybe a little <laughs> bit of rivalry going on. No. <laughs> I know. I think she was there <laughs> quite a few years after. Us, so. <laughs> so you guys have a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, great. Well, thank you, Julie. So as I mentioned earlier, we're just honored to have Britt Reddit with us today and a short bio on her. She was born and raised in Southern California. She graduated from Stanford University and later earned her MFA in fiction at the University of Michigan, where she won a Hopward Award in graduate short fiction, as well as the 2014 Hurston Wright Award for College Writers. She is a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 awardee, and her debut novel, The Mothers, was a New York Times bestseller. Her essays are featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Paris Review, and Jezebel. Her latest novel, The Vanishing Half, is out tomorrow. Lisa, take it away. Thank you. Uh, yes, congratulations on your book coming out tomorrow. Thank you. Um, it has made, I think, every list of like the 2020 <laughs> books to look for. O Magazine called it a page turner. Lit Hub said every bit as moving and thought provoking as Bennett's debut. Can you tell us what The Vanishing Half is about? Sure. So The Vanishing Half is a story about these twin sisters, Desiree and Stella, uh, who live their lives on these very different paths. One chooses to live as a white woman and one chooses to live as a black woman. Uh, so it's, it's a story about identity, it's about transformation, it's about families, um, it's about a lot of different things. It's sort of asking the question of kind of how we all become who we are. Well, um, I read that The Mothers, your debut, was born from some of your own fears about becoming pregnant young, not having your mother, uh, growing up in Southern California. How do you think, how did you think of the idea for The Vanishing Half and did it come from anything <laughs> in your own life? Yeah, well, it came from a conversation I had with my mother um, and it was, she was telling me about a, a town that she remembered from her childhood where, where the community continued to intermarry in hopes that their children would get lighter and lighter. Um, and it was such a strange thing that, uh, such a strange idea to me. Um, and it struck me, it was, it was disturbing and vivid and it sort of felt like the genesis of a novel, like there was a story in there somewhere. Um, so from there I started to think about the idea of twins. You know, twins are kind of this natural way to think about identity or think about, uh, you know, how we all turn out to be the way we are, whether it's nature or nurture, or any of these different things. Um, so it kind of grew from that idea into the vanishing half. So now it sounds like there might be some pressure on your mom to think of your next book idea. 
I, she, yeah. Hopefully she's working on that. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, <laughs> uh, you have been praised not only for your stories, but your characters. What goes into develop, developing them? What's your process? It's a good question. Um, you know, it, it, I think it depends. There's some characters that come to me pretty easily. Um, so there's a character in The Vanishing Half named Early Jones, and he's kind of this bounty hunter. And he was a character who arrived to me very easily. I kind of thought of this idea of this man who was abandoned as a child and is spending his life looking for hiding people. Um, there was something about that, that that really appealed to me, and I kind of got a sense of who he was pretty, pretty easily. Uh, but then I think there are other characters like Stella, one of the twins who is a very kind of hidden away person. Um, so for her, it was kind of like peeling away layer after layer as I continued writing drafts of trying to figure out what exactly it is that makes her tick. Well, you, it's, so you mentioned writing drafts. So can you tell us a little bit about your writing process? Do you, do you write your book in order? Do you outline? Do you have any quirks? Just anything <laughs> you can share with us. Yeah, I, so I don't outline. I, I know that works for a lot of people. For mm -hmm. me, it feels a little bit like homework. Um, so I don't like to outline. I just kind of like to just go for it and see where I end up in the draft. Um, but once I have at least one draft done, I, when I'm doing the second draft, I just start with a blank page and I type everything out, even if I'm not changing something. Um, and that for me is just helpful because you hear the voice of the story as you're just like copying it. Um, so that, that's a big part of my process, but I, I think for me, I just, I, it usually takes me a many, many drafts to figure something out. And with this story, this was a more complicated story, I think, than the mothers. There were just more characters. There were more, uh, there was more time that I had to figure out what to do with. So it took a lot. It took a lot of wrangling to try to figure out how to tell this story in a way that made the most sense. How long did it take you to write it from start to finish? It took about, I think I found the, uh, the note on my phone when I wrote down this thing that my mom told me. That note, I think, was in like 2014. So from like the moment I first started thinking about it to now, I guess about six years, I was not writing that entire time. Right. Uh, but that's a, about the amount of time I've been thinking about engaging with the story. Can you tell us a little bit about your covers? Because I mean, I have the mothers <laughs> right here and it's so vibrant yes. and so is your uh, novel that's coming out tomorrow. Are, yeah. are, are you involved in that process? Um, have the, the covers change or had yeah. they been one since the beginning? No, I mean, I, I weighed in towards the end, uh, but I'm just really, I'm really fortunate that uh, the people, the art department at Riverhead, I think they are the best art department um, in publishing. Um, I feel confident saying that, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I think that they, they do great books, right? Yeah. We we all kind oh, of agree. Yeah. Um, so oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they they just make you know really beautiful covers, and I think for the vanishing half, you know, we we kind of went back and forth on elements of it, but I think that one of the things that we liked was how it mirrors the cover of the mothers a little bit. There's still another right. sense of kind of a silhouette and. But in The Vanishing Half, you have these faces. You can't really tell if they're kind of blending into each other or if one is kind of consuming another. There's something beautiful, but also a little disturbing or upsetting about it. Um, and I think that that all kind of speaks to some of the thematics of the book. Yeah, it's definitely a book when you see it on, you know, at the bookstore, you're going to pick it up. And it's also a book that I think when you see it, they're going to they're going to remember the mothers and think the same person probably wrote these two books, which I exactly. think is a great thing. Yes. Um, what about the title? Was that always the yeah. title? How did you come up with it? <laughs> it was not always the title. I'm very bad at titles. Either like I know them immediately or I just never get there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was kind of a community effort. Um, I think it was probably my agent, Julia, who came up with it. Um, but it was my agent, Julia, my editor, Sarah, and myself, and all of us like throwing around titles mm -hmm. for weeks. Um, so eventually we decided that The Vanishing Half was the title that really worked because it spoke to, again, this idea of identity, um, the idea of this vanishing half of this family, the vanishing half of yourself. Um, it spoke to a lot of the thematics of the story in, in different ways. And it was also like a visual thing, you know, it, it made you think that you could kind of imagine something for it, which I think helps. I think between that and the cover, which Julie was just holding up, it's so beautiful, I think. Yeah you know, someone you walking by is going to pick that up, <laughs> flip you. it over and, and read, what is this about? Um, <laughs> Thank you, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Ju Julie, can you say something and hold it up? So if they're in speak. speak oh yeah, so they can see it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah I'll, I'll talk now. 
You don't have to ask me twice, Liz. Mm. <laughs> I know. Girl. Isn't that a great cover? And Claire, yeah. you you're on here too. We love this cover. We do love Riverhead covers. They are yes. the best, Brett. They're the best. They are such great covers. So yeah, love this cover. It is amazing. Um, Brett, we've got a, a comment uh, from here. Oh, uh, well, well, I wanted to just tell you one of your uh, El Camino teachers are on here. Oh. Connie Strauss. She sent oh. it. I just realized she sent it to me private. But I'm calling you out. I'm oh, nice. calling you out. So... <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, oh yeah, my God. El Camino, man. Woo, go Wildcats. Yeah, go Wildcats. Right. <laughs> go Panthers. Oh, sorry. That's just, that's <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> uh, so nonfiction. You've also, um, you've also written that some really thought provoking pieces, including one called Trump Time in Vogue, or I Don't Know What to Do with Good White People for Jezebel. And your fiction also highlights emotionally charged topics. So how does writing fiction and nonfiction compare in this regard? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think one, one thing for me is just thinking about the level of engagement that I wanted to have with that idea. Um, because I think the thing that's really gratifying for me about nonfiction is that it generally, I mean, writing an essay for me does not generally take six years. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a little bit more of an instant gratification when you're writing. And often you are writing something that's topical or you're responding to something. So speed is important. Um, and there's a way in which that uh, is gratifying and really nice to have, you know, be able to write something quickly and receive feedback on it quickly versus something like this where you're working on it for six years and then eventually you'll hear what people think about it, hopefully. Um, so I think that that's a big thing for me is thinking about is this something that I, like, is this an idea that I'm kind of married to and that I want to explore for six years? Or is this an idea that I just want to get something off my chest or, or want to respond to something that's in the news? Uh, so I think that that's a big thing for me that's different. Uh, but I think a thing that's similar is that I, I'm interest in asking questions. Um, I, I sometimes, I think people will read my nonfiction and, and demand answers from me. <laughs> and I'm always <laughs> like, I don't have them for you. I, you know, all I can do is sort of ask questions about, um, you know, what it means uh, to be alive within this country and, you know, what it means to be alive at this time and in this way. Um, and that's something that I like to do in my fiction too. I just want to ask questions about the world and, and not set out to actually um, answer them. <laughs> <laughs> and in you, get instant gratification almost from your essays, like a million people read, um, I don't know what to do with good white people the first week it was out. Um, and your agent actually found you through that. Can you tell that story? Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I wrote that essay. My uh, good friend Gia Talentino was an editor at Jezebel at the time, and she'd been bugging me about writing something for them. And I kept being like, no, I don't write nonfiction. I'm a novelist. Um, and then eventually I wrote this thing and it was an essay I sat down and wrote in you know, an hour and a half. I just had to kind of get something off my chest. Um, and then it ended up completely changing my life. Um, it, you know, it was an essay that my, um, my agent Julia read on her lunch break. And that was kind of what led us to connect. Uh, and it's unfortunately an essay that continues to have a longer life uh, because people uh, constantly are, you know, reposting it when something bad is happening with the news, um, such as right now, um, as far as uh, racial violence and, and police violence. So that's a thing that makes me cringe a little bit when I see people start to repost it because I know that that's the larger context of the essay is, is something that's bad. Uh, but at the same time, I'm glad that I wrote something that people connect to and, and um, yeah, that it resonates with people. Yeah, it's, start, it's starting a conversation and anybody that's reading is gonna take from it something different, I'm sure. Yeah, I think so. um, you also said in an interview, I know my work will be read politically no matter what I do. People want work by people of color to be representative. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think often um, you know people think that if you were writing about blackness or if you're writing about being marginalized in any way that that is political uh, versus if you're writing about whiteness or if you're writing about being in a majority group that is not political um, and that's that's just something that you know I, I know that that's how people read work often um, so it doesn't you know upset me but I do 
think that it's, you know, it's an unfair way of reading work. Uh, and, and I hope that, you know, I know that my work is political, but I also hope that it's read and appreciated for its aesthetic merit, because I'm interested in writing something beautiful uh, more, than, more than anything. Well, it's got to be um, just such an interesting um, thing for you to have these essays out there and then these books. And you're not exactly the same person in both of them, but yeah. probably people want you to be. Yeah. Um, the Mothers, you know, was a huge success. New York Times bestseller. It was your debut. Can you tell us about if there any pressure writing your sophomore novel and, and what that <laughs> felt like? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think there was some pressure. Um, I was so fortunate that people responded so enthusiastically to the mothers, uh, which is nothing that I expected. Um, you know, I was working on that book for seven or eight years, the majority of that time in which nobody saw it but me. Um, so I had no expectation there would be an audience, you know, and with the second book, I knew that somebody was going to read it. You know, I knew that there would be an audience. Um, and I think that there's a pressure you feel, you know, you don't want to let down the people who liked the thing that you just did, but you also don't want to do that thing again. You know, you want to do something different. So I think for me, eventually I had to just realize that I had to just pretend that there was going to be no audience. I had to just write the book that, uh, that made me happy and the book that made me proud. Um, because you can't create when you're thinking too much about who's reading it, you know, it, that, that just kind of traps you. Um, so I had to just kind of try my best to push that out of my, my head, um, and, and just try to forge ahead and write the book that I wanted to write. Well, Rick, I, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm interrupting. sorry, I Go wanted ahead. to tell you, and Lisa, I don't know if you remember this, the year that the mothers came out, we were at BEA and it, BEA is book expo for, oh, yeah, in Chicago. For having been. yeah, yeah. Was it in Chicago? That you, so I remember going yeah. one year and you're, the mothers was everywhere. And <laughs> it was everywhere. Everywhere. Like <laughs> so you kind of know we've been several years and Julie goes every year. Julie, you can, I know, you know, too. When you go and there's certain, they have that book everywhere and they got it up on the poster <laughs> and then it's like everywhere in the thing. You're like, this is the book. So <laughs> like, I, I made sure to grab, I'm like, this is going to be the book. So like I grabbed yeah, the copy. Yeah, I remember that. I remember <laughs> yeah, that. We had, a, was, we had a copy way before it came out. <laughs> well, it's also the, I mean, it's also the cover, right? Like they make tote bags. Right. Yay. And that was, I remember it was so surreal walking around, you know, like huge, like weird conference. And you're just walking around and people have a tote bag with your book cover on it. And nobody knows who you are, you know, right. like I I'd be talking to people and they had your, um, the book jacket on your name tag. So people like staring down my name tag and then they saw the image of the jacket. It was like, oh, you're the person with the right. tote bag, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was very surreal, but, but I do think, you know, I think a lot of that credit for, for that uh, is due to the book jacket, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in because that is the thing that happens is that you and that is the thing for you, Britt, too. Kind of a question to it, where there's an, an anonymity that happens as an author. Yeah. That is different from like if you're a celebrity, you know. And so that has to be kind of that weird thing too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I. I I don't know. I never think of any writer of as being famous. I don't know. I guess there are people like writers who could walk into like a room and people will, you know, but I think it's I think, your, fa like I think your family that's on here thinks you're pretty famous. <laughs> <laughs> they're probably going to be they're all, they're, all, they're all nodding their heads. I'm watching no. you all <laughs> um, Well, by the way, a tote bag is another marker of like it books. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. And just, let you know. I want to remind everyone too, if you have a question to ask, to ask in the chat or ask me to unmute you and I'll, I'll come find you in the gallery and let you ask yourself. Um, Don't be yeah. shy. I'm sure yours are better than mine. So <laughs> come forward with them. But I, I do have another. Um, you were young when you wrote The Mothers. Um, and was it 19 to 26? Was that the, is that yeah, accurate? Else. Just about. Mm -hmm. um, and no one could believe that you you had written this story at such a young age. <laughs> um, what was it like to hear that kind of feedback? And and where do you think that story did come from at such a young age? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think it was probably a combination of like, I mean, I think probably it was mostly like the voices of these older women that threw people. <laughs> I right. think if I had just written the coming of age story, people would have uh, like expected that more. Um, 
Yeah, it was strange. Um, I'm, I'm the youngest person in my family. So I'm kind of used to being in a space of, you know, sitting under the kitchen table and eavesdropping and listening and <laughs> observing. Like that's, that's the mode in which I feel pretty comfortable. So I think that the story probably came from some space like that for me of just being used to being the youngest person in the room and watching what everybody else is talking about and the things that they don't want you to know that they're talking about. And of course, really tuning into those things as you do. Um, so I think it came from that space, but I do think that, yeah, the, the, the reaction to the book on that ground was also pretty um, funny and bizarre for me to experience. <laughs> <laughs> Britt, we, ha we have someone that wants to make a comment. I just need to unmute her. Okay, Jody. I just at you should be able to unmute. I just it put did ask to unmute. There you are. Hi, Bennett family. <laughs> you know, Britt, I, I remember you growing up. Your dad hired me at the city attorney's office, and Pam is also on here. We're, we're, we're supporting you. Uh -huh. and so proud of you. I just wanted to, to make sure you and you knew Pam and I are so proud of you. Thank we you. knew you when you used to have little pigtails. <laughs> you were never under the table. You were always running. <laughs> we had a lot of Christmas parties at your house and you, I felt like we grew up with you. So we're, we're just, so, you know, Pam and I know I just speaking for her too, we're so proud of you. And she said you were on a, on a bestseller list. I went looking and looking in the airport for your books and um, I'm just excited to read um, both of them now um, that I've got the second one on my um, my agenda. So anyway, I just wanted to say it was good timing for when you said you were growing up and this and that. So. <laughs> thank you so much. And, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. Yeah, I don't know if you remember Pam or I, but maybe Pam more than me because I think she's probably been... <laughs> Like 12, 13 years, I remember you growing up. So. I remember those Christmas parties. I remember those. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate that. That's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thanks, Jody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good timing, Jody. We couldn't have planned that better. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there another, or should I move forward? Uh, no, go ahead. Move forward. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask about the mother's development deal with Carrie Washington, um, where that's at. And if I read that you were going to write the screenplay, so have you tried to tackle that yet? And then if so, how different is that from writing a novel? Yeah, so I did write a draft of the screenplay. I have since handed it off to studio and the movie adaptation gods will do whatever it is that they will do. <laughs> Um, so that's completely out of my hands now, um, but it was very strange and it was a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, I think I went into it knowing that it was going to be a different beast and I knew that, you know, it was something that I'd never done before, had never written a screenplay. So I expected a challenge, but I just don't think I was prepared to think <laughs> in the way that you have to think to create a film, you know? I. I am so interested in interiority and what people are thinking and feeling, right. and what something smells like, and you know, like those types of details that you're interested in when you write a novel. And you know, a lot of the feedback I'd be getting would just be like, you know, get to the point. Like, <laughs> like, one, of, one of the best, one of the best things of feedback I heard, which I actually have implemented into my fiction writing, was somebody was like, "You have scenes where characters are talking about doing something, and then they go do the thing. Why don't you just have them go do the thing?" And I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's true. They could just be at the party. I don't have to have them talking about going to the party um, because those are the types of things you can't do in a film, you know, those types of moments that are kind of filler. Um, so there are ways in which I think I was able to use some of those skills that I learned to try to be a little bit more economical uh, with my scenes and with my writing, with my fiction. Um, but at the same time, it, it was totally different. I don't think I will ever do it again. Um, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful for the experience and I hope that the movie gets made someday. That would be amazing. That would be great. Sounds like you're, I mean, it sounds pretty good if you've written a screenplay. <laughs> that's a many, many steps past what a lot of other authors have told us. So that's, yeah. I'm, that's rooting, <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Do you have Liz or? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, All right. I have one question. Um, do you want to come back to California after being uh, in New York during this pandemic? Has oh. it changed I'm your like, perspective? Is that, I'm like, is this question from my mom? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what my mom wants to know. Um, okay. You know, now, well, not right now. Um, I'm staying in New York at least another year. Uh, I know a lot of people who are who are trying to leave the city and people who have left the city and 
it's very understandable why. Um, but I just have had the time of my life being in New York. I really love the city and, you know, I want to see it bounce back. So I'm planning to be here at least another year. We'll see what happens after that. I generally kind of live my life like six months at a time. So I don't know what's going to happen beyond that. Um, but um, I love California too. I'm hoping to be out there to visit sometime soon. Um, but for now, now, I'm in New York. You have, you have some support. Rena is saying New York is the best. <laughs> Sorry, Brit's mom. <laughs> getting some encouragement over here in the chat to, to stay. So. All right, Lisa, it's back. Oh, it's on back. Okay. Um, well, you know, I'm just curious about you now. Like, what are you doing when you're not writing? What are your other kind of fun things that you like to do? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> in quarantine, um, I have been reading a lot. Uh, it, it took me a, a long time to kind of get my attention span back. I don't know if you guys felt that way too. Yes. Um, I was really struggling to focus on anything <laughs> in the very beginning. Um, but once I kind of started getting the swing of things, I started reading a lot and that's been, um, that's been really gratifying. I, I'm not working on, I finished a draft of something earlier in the quarantine. So I've just been reading. I haven't really been writing anything. So that's been really good. Um, and I love TV. I probably watch too much TV, <laughs> but, um, I just love watching TV and I've been watching more movies, um, lately too. Um. And yeah, outside of quarantine, I've just been enjoying being in New York, uh, meeting new friends and, and going out and doing everything. And now that the weather's at least nice, I hope I'll, I'll be able to make out to the park and take walks and do things like that. Okay, what, I've got- can you, Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead, Lise, finish and then I'm I back. was just gonna ask, um, what are some of the books that you read? Would you recommend any of them? Yeah, I would. Um, so the book that uh, resurrected my attention span uh, was okay. The Glass Hotel. Uh, by Emily St. John Mandel, which just came out, uh, I think a few months ago. Um, and it's a book about like a Ponzi scheme and it is so propulsive. Um, it kind of goes into this person who's uh, orchestrating the Ponzi scheme. You see the people who are the victims of it. You see the people who are sort of complicit in it. You see all of these different characters that are involved within this world. Uh, so I enjoyed that book a lot. Um, I, uh, what else have I been reading? I just, uh, oh God, now my mind is going. Blank. I know, I'm oh, sorry I, to put you on the spot. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I read uh, the book Actress by Anne Enright, uh, which I think also came out fairly recently. And it's about the daughter of this Irish theater legend and their sort of complicated relationship. Um, so it was a really beautiful book and, and also a book about a complicated mother-daughter relationship, which is something that I enjoy, um, as you'll see if you've read um, either of my books. So very much on brand for me, and I enjoyed that book a lot, too. So there's some action over in the chat now. So, <laughs> uh, uh, Raina saying she, she loved The Glass Hotel. Um, and then um, someone said they read The Glass House. They purchased it from Warwick's. Oh, nice little <laughs> plug. There's someone else that wants to say hi to you, but I'm going to wait and get through these questions okay. first. It'll be like a mystery. You're going to have to wonder. Who, you're going to have to wonder who it is. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a question that came in uh, privately to me, but I think it's a good question. Where does the vanishing half take place? Oh, OK. Um, so it takes place in a lot of different places, actually. Uh, it begins in Louisiana. Uh, it goes eventually to out Los Angeles. There's a bit where you end up in New York. There's a little bit in the Midwest. Um, so it is kind of a bit of a, um, I don't know, I can't say globe trotting, but um, there's a sense of movement amongst all these different characters. Um, and I was interested in the idea of, you know, home and what it means to leave home and to take it with you, even though you're not physically there anymore. Uh, someone's asking, because I think this relates, did you go to Louisiana to get a feel for the book? You know, I didn't go there so much to research it. I, I went to visit family. Um, so I've been, um, yeah, I've been quite a few times recently, uh, and mostly to see family and to hang out while I'm there. Uh, I was in New Orleans for uh, this past New Year's Eve, um, and that's just because I love that city. Um, so I've spent time there with family, and I think that that has also yeah, I think I think thinking about New Orleans and, and context of this book was fun because the idea of it sort of being positioned as like kind of the big dangerous city uh, for these characters who grow up in this very small town and that that's part of the allure it has for them. <laughs> they want to escape their small town and, 
and end up in this big city and that's that's where they their lives kind of diverge okay there's another question here um, from holly she says i know a lot of us are trying to diversify our reading list and i'm curious if when you said your writing is often seen as political, is there any sort of pressure given that there's a tendency to take one's experience and apply it to an entire group? I hope this question makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I think for me, I'm always interested in just writing about specific characters and whoever that might be. Um, and I don't feel pressure to feel like I can't tell this type of story because this might make this group look bad or this might people might read this and you know I don't I don't feel that way uh, when I'm writing because I I just I want to just write about people um, and their specific lives and for me that was a liberating thing when I started to think in that way of I don't have to be representative I don't have to speak for a large amount of people um, I'm telling the specific story that I want to tell um, and if people extrapolate larger things from it that's fine but that's not my responsibility uh, to do that. And I think that fiction is the best when it's specific. Uh, I think that's where it becomes sort of universal. So for the mothers, I, 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 you know, I wrote this book about these black kids that set in Oceanside and that was really nothing that I had ever read before. Um, but for me, it was like the specificity of writing the story that's set in this place that a lot of people have not heard of. Um, you know, I, I talked about that book you know, in Italy, I talked about that book in France and people were connecting to this book about these black teenagers from Oceanside, you know? So even outside of the context, outside of the country and the language, people were still connecting to the story. Um, so for me, that, that's, that's what makes fiction really good is when you're able just to write about something specific and people can apply it uh, to their own lives. Yeah, that's an amazing answer. I love that, that it's universal and, and I agree. Uh, Amy's asking, are you constantly scanning the world and friends for ideas for writing? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean a bit. I, 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 I pull a lot on my family um, and, uh, you know, I think that there's so many stories that you get in talking to people and often people will not think something is interesting that they're telling you and you find it really fascinating. Um, so, you know, I try to do it in a way that's not exploitative or that people feel like I'm taking notes when they're talking. Um, but sometimes someone will say something to you very offhandedly that really sticks with you or that, or that resonates with you, or there's like a story just hidden in there somewhere and it's just something that's like a throwaway thing that they're telling you. Um, so, you know, I try not to write, I wouldn't write about anything too personal in somebody's life. I wouldn't, um, write about something in a way that would identify them or, you know, or, or, or embarrass right. them or anything like that. But, um, but I definitely do to find some inspiration from the lives of the people I know. Uh, I, I have to admit that. Uh, Julie, I know someone sent a question to you and then we're going to have this special person unmuted. Hello <laughs> okay. to you. This is really I'm, stressful. I'm, I'm like, lying, <laughs> but it's, it's not, I'm just, it's just someone who asked me. I'm really building it up. I, I, don't have, I don't have a lot going on in my life. I just I can go into the chat room. That's all I do. I think, that, I think this was a mistake that it got said to me privately, so I'll just read this one. It says, the church is so important in your first novel. Does it reappear in the new one? What role does this centerpiece of African-American culture and family play in the new novel? Without prying, does it play any role in your current life? Do you want me to reread oh. that at all? I know. I think I have a sense of the question. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yeah. The, so the mothers, it's centered around this very small church community um, and these young people that go to the church and these older people that are kind of observing their lives and commenting on it. Um, and that was a space that I was interested in exploring, particularly in the context of this teenage girl who's had this abortion, the controversial thing that she has done that she has to hide. Um, and I was kind of interested in thinking about how she's moving through this community how people are perceiving her, all the complexity of that. Um, as far as the vanishing half, there's sort of some glimmers, I think. It's definitely less than the mothers. Um, there's sort of glimmers of the Catholicism and, um, and particularly Black Catholicism, which I, I grew up going to Catholic Church for most of my childhood. Um, so that's kind of a space that I am also interested in um, that I don't see a lot of in, in fiction. Um, so there, there are glimmers of it. Um, I don't, there used to, there were like, there were drafts where there was like a, a priest character and like, so there was more, but I think some of that um, was dialed down. But, but yeah, I've, I've, I grew up going to church. I grew up in the church. 
Um, and, you know, I think that in a lot of ways it's informed, uh, it's informed my life and also kind of my approach to fiction. I think, uh, you know, I, I try to approach fiction in a way that is empathetic and, and also a way that sort of acknowledges that, that, I don't know, that you're telling stories of a community and not just stories of the individual. And I think in a lot of ways that probably is informed by, by me going to church as a kid. Definitely. Okay. Christine Esteban. Oh, no, you're <laughs> unmuted. Hi, Brett. Hi. I just wanted to say hello and also say how proud I am of you and how absolutely honored I am to have been like a, just a glimpse in your life. <laughs> up. For those of you who don't know, I, I was um, Brett's AP language teacher uh, at El Camino High School quite a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> But I'm so excited to read your this new novel that you have out. Of course, I've read The Mothers and <laughs> love that book. So I'm really excited about it. And I'm just so happy for you. And I'm just so happy for your writing success. I mean, it's just really, really exciting from the standpoint of a teacher. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think New York is amazing. So I'm really <laughs> jealous that you get to <laughs> Her mom's going to come get you. She's going to jump out of the square to well, your you know, square. Eventually, Britt, yeah. you got you to come back. You already <laughs> touted how amazing uh, Oceanside is in France and Italy. <laughs> eventually, you'll find your way back home. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Christine, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. L Lisa, if you, uh, okay. I know. This is really it, cute. That's really sweet. Someone said this is the <laughs> sweetest couch serving session yet, and I think I agree, Holly. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm just going to give you another question from the group. It's from Pamela. She's asking, do you have a new book project that you're working on? Ooh, I do. Um, it's still very early. So it's, I wrote like the longest quarantine draft. I don't know if the book is good or if this is just my, my quarantine brain. Uh, because I think when I'm anxious, I actually get very productive. I'm not like paralyzed by my anxiety, which is like good in a sense, maybe, probably, <laughs> probably not yeah. so much, but a good little bit, but, but so when I was in the early days of quarantine, I was just, you know, trapped in my apartment and had nothing really to do and wanted to focus on something that wasn't, you know, everything. Um, so I just kept working on this draft. So I have, uh, I think I'm on my second draft. Um, it's so, um, obscenely long and just unwieldy and unmanageable. Uh, but I'm hoping that I can shape it into something that's coherent eventually. So it's a story, it's about uh, these two singers who are in a girl group and they have a lifelong feud. Uh, and the novel kind of goes into their lives and the lives of the people who know them and, and sort of what happened to fracture that relationship. Uh, so it's very different than The Mothers and the Vanishing Half. And it's, I don't know, it was, I don't know if bigger is the right word, but it's just, it's about sort of fame and celebrity. And it's, you know, it's very different than these stories, which are kind of small, intimate uh, stories. So it's a challenge and I'm hoping that eventually I'll be able to go back to it and <laughs> make it into something that is not this kind of giant block of text that I wrote through quarantine anxiety. Sounds awesome. I don't yeah, know. it really yeah. does. I was gonna say, are there any mother-daughter relationships in <laughs> there? There are. There oh, are. So there we go. Yes, there you go. <laughs> uh, Laura Spalding is asking, what authors inspire you and are there any new and upcoming writers that you would recommend? There are. Um, the authors that inspire me, um, Toni Morrison, um, that's an obvious one, I think, for probably all of us. Um, you know, that's one of the first writers that I remember just really being blown away by. I, I found like this copy of The Bluest Eye on my parents' bookshelf and I read it, um, even though it was like very young and did not really understand it. Um, but that's a book that, that means a lot to me and that's a, a, a writer that, that means so much to me. Um, and I think also James Baldwin, uh, as far as someone who writes nonfiction and fiction and screenplays and just kind of did it all. Uh, and uh, I, I actually like uh, Baldwin's fiction, I think, more than I like his nonfiction, which 
it was kind of like a minority op opinion. Um, I think most people seem to really like his essays more, but I really love his fiction. Um, I finally finished Another Country uh, maybe about a year ago. I started it in college. I was just like, this book is too depressing. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, and I don't know what that says about my life now because I was able to finish it. Um, but, but that's an artist I really love. Uh, and as far as other up and coming, uh, she's not up and coming, but um, one of my good friends, Y.A. Two Moore, has a memoir coming out also tomorrow um, called The Dragons, the Giant, the Women. Um, and it's a memoir about her journey surviving the Liberian Civil War. Um, and she kind of uncovers how she, were, her family was actually rescued by a rebel soldier and uh, like a female rebel soldier. And she's trying to kind of find who this woman was and figure out why she helped them. Um, so that's an incredible book that comes out tomorrow. Um, and another one is a book called Luster by Raven Leilani. And that comes so out. Good. In, it's so good. So good. Um, that comes <laughs> out in August. It's no, it's amazing. Um, it comes out in August. This is a debut. And it was the first book by and about millennials that felt right to me. Like I never felt, I never felt like, you know, I mean, no offense uh, to like girls or like some of these, you know, like I never felt like that seemed real. Uh, but <laughs> Lester is about um, this kind of hapless millennial who has this job at a publishing house. Uh, and, you know, she's kind of bad at her job and she's, you know, on Tinder meeting people and it's terrible. Um, and she ends up getting kind of in, wrapped up in this uh, open marriage uh, with this couple and then also like kind of forms a bond with their kid. Um, oh. So it's so interesting. It's so funny and it's also heartbreaking and it does that like funny heartbreaking slide when you're least expecting it. Um, so there'll be moments where I'm laughing at like, yeah, Tinder's the worst. And then it, she just breaks your heart. Um, so that's an incredible book. And I think that, you know, when you're reading a debut, you want to, like to me, the most important question is like, do I want to read book two by this person? And when I finished reading that book, I was like, yeah, I want to read book two, book three, book four. Like, I want to see mm -hmm. this person's career unfold. Uh, so that's a great book that comes out in August that, that you all should definitely check out. Oh, that's oh, so, oh, they want you to say the name of the book again yes, and the author. It's, yes, it's called Luster. Um, it's by Raven Leilani. Uh, I don't remember who's publishing it. Sorry. Um, it's FSG. FSG. Um, yeah, it comes out in August. You should pre-order it um, from Warwick's. And... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you should. Uh, you should. Uh, you should also pre-order Waiichi's book. Uh, but but yeah, those are those are two um, amazing books that I also really loved. Julie, can you put the link for Lester in the chat if someone sure. would like to pre-order it? Yeah. Just oh, someone said phone, that's how that's how we feel about you, Britt, enjoying oh. watching your career unfold. Oh, you thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you. Everybody's so nice. I know. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Um, all right, Lisa, it's, it's, you've got, you've got another question, right? Um, I, no, we covered them. I was going to ask what you're working on now. So you, you answered that and I'm good unless there's more coming in. Um, can you, um, tell us what the, your virtual events look like over the next couple of weeks? If anybody here wants to join you and I, I'm just honestly curious what you're doing <laughs> since we have one coming out soon. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to see if you're doing anything cool that we need to try to book. Yeah. But, it's so yeah. interesting. Like this, this is my first virtual event. So thank you everybody for making this so special. Um, I honestly really appreciate it. I had no idea what this was going to look like, like, like you were just saying. Um, so I have, if you go to my website, just BrittBennett.com, there's like an events page and I'll have links there to do things. Some of them are Instagram lives, some of them are Zooms. Um, and yeah, I have, uh, an event with Shran Bookstore on Wednesday. Um, I have an event with Literati Bookstore. It was my hometown bookstore in Ann Arbor. I have that event on Thursday. Um, and then I think the other things I have an event with, uh, my friend Jasmine Hughes, who's an editor at the New York Times Magazine, and we have an event, I think, on Saturday. Um, so if you go to my website, if you go to my Instagram, um, you'll see all the links for all the things. Um, if you want to pop up something else, uh, I would love to see you there. Can you give us uh, your website and your Instagram handle, and if you're on Facebook as well? Yes. Uh, so website is just BrittBennett.com. Instagram handle is Britt R. Bennett, and that's also my Twitter handle. Um, and, ooh, what's my Facebook? I think it's Britt Bennett Writes on Facebook, but if you just Google Britt Bennett and Facebook, it'll probably pop up. 
Um, so yeah, you can follow me there. I'll be posting links to things that I'm doing. Um, and, and yeah, you can tune in. Uh, so we've got a question and also a comment. Joe K says he's seen a lot of Zoom book discussions. This is proving to be one of the most entertaining ones. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you're entertained. So, thank you. Thanks, thank you Joe guys. <laughs> thank you guys for making this making this so great. And making this serious. <laughs> uh, and then Pauline has a question, and I um I, I love this question. She says you just talked about writing a book with. Uh, a book about music. What music are you listening to now? What music inspired you on that one? Ooh, that's, so this, that's a good question. So um, the music I'm listening to now, I've been listening to a lot of 80s pop. I just needed to feel alive and feel a beat and like feel happy. So just like the cheesiest 80s pop is what I was listening to before this. Um, so I've enjoyed that. Uh, but the new book, it takes place mostly in the 60s and 70s. So that's uh, mostly just 60s and 70s soul, a lot of girl groups. Um, so I have like a girl group playlist. Um, uh, and it kind of begins with a girl group and kind of ends in the age of disco. So a lot of disco also. Um, so I have a lot of different people have been asking what I was listening to to write The Vanishing Half and I didn't really have a great answer. Um, this new book, I actually have several playlists that have been instrumental, I think, in part because I'm writing about music. Um, so it's been really fun just to be able to listen to all that music and enjoy it, even when I'm not writing. Do you ever post the playlist? Because I, I know occasionally we've done that when we've had it. It's yeah. Kind of, you're kind of, no, I kind of I, want to listen to yours. It's you know, I'm like have, a stalker. <laughs> I haven't, but people have, a few people have asked. So I'm like, okay, maybe I should. I'm usually should. so like... I'm usually so kind of like ashamed of what I'm listening to. I like hide, <laughs> I hide my activity on Spotify. I'm like, no one needs to know how many times I'm like looping, you know, landslide as I'm trying to get through quarantine. Um, but, but maybe next time I'll, I'll share the playlist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Julie, I think you have a question, right? Yep. Yep. Somebody's got one. Um, Julie and Dave are asking, did you come up to Miracosta when Maya Angelou spent the day with students when you were here in San Diego? Oh, no, I didn't. I wish. I know, <laughs> I right? Did, I think I all didn't. of us are kind of yeah. wishing that. <laughs> I totally wish I had. Um, no, I didn't. You know, it's, it's, it, it's a bummer to think of all of the amazing writers and artists that I've never been able to see in person. Um, you know, I've heard so many like sto iconic stories about people who had gone to Toni Morrison readings and like how transcendent that experience was. Um, so it bums me out that I haven't been able to do some of those things, but I'm glad at least that I can continue to engage with, with their work after they've, after they've left us. Exactly. Well, I think the one, I mean, there's a lot of negative things about COVID, but I'll say the one positive thing is it is easier for people maybe in rural areas or other areas that don't have a bookstore to connect with authors and hear what you have to say. Absolutely. Um, we've gotten that feedback uh, a lot. Oh, Julie just put the uh, order link for Lester. Yeah, you guys okay. are going to want to read that one. I'm, oh, we're totally. That sounds really good. It's so good. Yeah. Um, it's so well, good. It's like, I'm an old lady, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I even, and I, I even liked it. It's just like, there are, you are so right, Britt. There's times when it's like you're just cringing, and then it's yeah. just like, woo! <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that, that is all we have. We want to thank everybody for showing up tonight. We had a great crowd. Britt, we're so excited to thank you. see you and your book soar. Um, Please, uh, if you're going to order, order from Warwick's. And um, as she mentioned, you can also order any of our backlist or you can pre-order How to Save a Life. If you do pre-order that, we will personalize it uh, for you and they'll ship it. Um, and you can find us at Lisa and Liz on Instagram and lizandlisa.com. And if you go to the events page or backslash events, you can find all the events. Tomorrow, we have Francis Mays who is the author of um, Under the Tuscan Sun, which is one of my favorite books. She has a travel picture book, right? Am I saying this right, Julie? Like, what mm -hmm. am I describing yeah, it correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's at, we're at noon tomorrow. So we're getting crazy because her co-author is actually in uh, Rome, right? Or she's in Italy. Tus Tuscany, yeah, she's in Tuscany. Oh, sorry, Tuscany. Uh, so we're going to be going live at noon tomorrow. So please join us at noon so we're not sitting here talking to ourselves, although we would do that too. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, again, thank you, everybody. Britt, we're just going to be rooting you on your so you charming so and amazing and and we wishing you so much success thank you here's so much book, here's the thank book you. again
<laughs> yes. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. All right, you guys. Have All a great right. night. Thank you so okay, much. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.